the second week of a, a series that we called uh, God's Timing. And, and you say, why God's Timing? Uh, the idea is this, that throughout history, God's sovereignty is evident and his timing is perfect. And his timing is not always ours, but it's always perfect. And even when it doesn't look like it, he sees the bigger picture and he's often working uh, on a bigger plan. Maybe you remember Romans chapter eight, verse 28, it says that we know in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. That's anybody thankful that God has a bigger purpose. I, I am today. There was a moment uh, in history where Abraham Lincoln in the Gettysburg Address, he spoke of a government that was of the people and by the people and for the people. And this statement that was made, uh, and it's actually written in, in, in his like final draft that's on a desk in uh, DC today, but this statement that it was actually borrowed from a pastor, from a clergyman, and it was shared uh, before Lincoln ever said it. And my question that I would start with today is what happens when the government is no longer that? What happens when the government is no longer for the people or by the people? And maybe you would say to some extent we face that today. And in the scripture, when we open up the Bible in Daniel chapter six, and you can uh, go there with me today and we're gonna look at it in a couple minutes. Daniel finds himself in that very place where there's some things going on in the government that are kind of messed up. and. Uh, I was reading this last week that Ronald Reagan in his inaugural speech, he said this, that a government is not the solution to the problem, government is the problem. It's an interesting statement. Maybe that resonates with you today. I, I think most of us in the room with a variety of different uh, backgrounds and families, I think we would agree that we live in interesting times. And the way of the Bible for believers in the room the way of Jesus, if you've been walking with him for a long time, it's been under attack in our culture. And it's made its way into many of our government leaders and their decisions. David said this in Psalm chapter 11, when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? In other words, when the principles or the pillars that were built on are taken down, when there's things that are put into place that, uh, the things that are supposed to protect good, when those things that are undermined, what can the righteous do? There's two different primary texts that we look at as believers in scripture when it comes to our relation to the government, Romans chapter 13 and 1 Peter chapter two, and Romans tells us to submit to authority and that all authority comes from God. 1 Peter two says the same thing about living in a pagan society, and we understand as believers today that disobedience to, uh, different moments in, in, in government and, and leaders, it's warranted when it comes to uh, the point of crossing the line and causing us to deny the Lord or to sin or to not be able to worship the God that we serve. This would be true when we look at moments in the book of Daniel. In just about every Christian generation, uh, there's been struggles with relation to the government, partly because throughout world history and church history, there's such a variety of different governments and different leaders from, from the worst of tyrants to democracy. And, and I would say that we fared better in the last couple hundred years because whether you believe it or not, we were founded on Christian faith. It's in our documents. We were founded on biblical principles, which many of them have now faded in the majority of our culture. Daniel chapter six points to a moment of persecution because this guy, Daniel, who was a prophet, he was unwilling to compromise his faith and a corrupt government with some different corrupt leaders, they knew that about him in, the place, in a place called Babylon. Babylon, as Daniel was a leader there, it actually became a place of great danger for him. And I would say this even today, hostility toward our faith and things that we profess to believe and live by, uh, there's already been hostility at different moments in our culture and it could quickly happen at an even greater level. I mean, we've seen how fast sometimes things happen in culture in different nations. Babylon 
in the scripture is an example of the ebbs and the flows of history that are gonna continue until Jesus returns. In other words, there will be nations that rise and fall. There will be evil that, that rises and falls until Jesus returns and defeats evil once and for all. Anybody believe that today, that Jesus is coming back? Babylon was not the first society that experienced evil and it won't be the last. And I, I find it interesting that every generation has a group of people that are like, man, we are in the last of the last days. Jesus is coming in 1985. We're in the last of the last days. The year 2000, the computers are crashing. Jesus is coming back. I think it's a little bit small-minded and, and narrow-sighted to say that because we don't know the day or the hour the scripture tells us. It could be tomorrow, it could be another couple thousand years, but here we are today, 2,000 years later after Jesus was resurrected, we know that he's coming back, we don't know when, but the fact is God is patient so that one more might come to know him in, as we live our lives here and now. So I wanna, I wanna talk about for the next few minutes what to do when it looks like Babylon. Because it, it, it will look like that again and again as the Lord tarries would be the church word. C.S. Lewis once pointed out that the state is temporary, but human beings are eternal. Thus, everlasting life that we have makes the individual much more important than an empire that's going to rise and it's going to fall. Leaders of today, nations of today, they eventually fade. They're not permanent. And I'm telling you, man, I'm proud to be an American. I, lo I love our nation, but we have to remember that uh, the red, white, and blue is not the same as eternity in heaven. There's a difference. Eternity is forever. Thus, individual hearts are what matters most to the God that we serve. And what I know about history is that throughout the church history, there are moments of revival that come out of some of the darkest days. And so if you think, man, there's some stuff happening and it's not looking good and it's looking dark, listen, Every time that happens, there are moments where hearts turn to the Lord and God uses the darkest moments to bring the most people to him. And I'm one of the crazy people that believes that we have yet to see the greatest revival in the history of the world. And I'm, and I'm one that's not gonna just focus on the bad every day of my life, but I'm gonna focus on Jesus and say, Lord, if, if there's gonna be some stuff that happens, would you bring more people to you as they're at the end of their rope and they don't know what to do with the economy and they don't know what's gonna happen with this or that, would you turn people to yourself, Lord? I believe that revival will come out of even this church, the prayers of people in this church, the commitment of people to be faithful to the Lord. Daniel chapter six, I'm getting too ahead of myself. Daniel chapter six, verse one, it says this, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps, not mouse traps, satraps, to rule throughout the kingdom. And it says with three administrators, over all of them, one was Daniel. And they were made accountable to them so the king might not suffer loss. Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. And at this, the administrators and satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and he was neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we'll never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the laws of his God. So this chapter that we're looking at in Daniel, it immediately follows uh, the previous king being killed, and then this guy Darius takes over, and he uses, which they love to do this in that day and age, he uses all of the existing talent and says, okay, you guys are gonna rule over all the different areas. And so the satraps were kind of like mayors or governors. And when we first meet Daniel, all the way back in chapter one, he's this young, capable, smart, courageous, bold guy. By the time that we get to Daniel six, he's probably in his 80s as a man. And so I say that to say he's seen a lot. He's been through a lot. He survived the exile of the Jewish people from their homeland to Babylon. He uh, didn't just survive when there's all of these different uh, regime changes. He actually thrived. How many know that it's possible to thrive even when your government is messed up by the power of God? 
it's incredible that he gets selected as, as one of these three rulers, and then the king is going to put him, like, above everybody. They could find no corruption in him. Why? The Bible says he's trustworthy. In other words, he was faithful. He was filled with integrity. Church, what frustrates the most? The plotting and the planning of evil, jealous, petty people. It's faithfulness to the God that you serve. That's who Daniel was. I want to give you six thoughts quickly this morning when it comes to, when it looks like Babylon in our culture. The first one is in the form of a question, and it's this question for every person in the room. Are you faithful? If, if you were truly honest with yourself, are you faithful? Are, are you a person that wavers and, and changes like the tides, or are you faithful? Daniel was faithful. This, this verse, I think it actually, that we just read, it, it has a really good definition of faithfulness when it says that he was neither corrupt nor negligent. Daniel, he didn't do things he shouldn't do, and he also didn't leave undone the things that he was supposed to do. He, he did right, he did good by people, he followed through on his duties, he wasn't lazy, he wasn't guilty. Those are the things that make for a faithful individual. In other words, it, he wasn't just a hardworking guy, but, but because he worked hard, he gave himself some extra perks and, and did some things that were kind of questionable. No, he didn't do that, that's not faithfulness. He wasn't just, just a, a careful guy, yet kind of lazy at the same time. No, he, he, was, he was a hardworking guy, not a workaholic, but he was hardworking. He was faithful to his job. He wasn't manipulative. He was responsible. He was trusted. Thus, the king said, I want this guy to rule over all these other people. His faithfulness, it, 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 it bore fruit. Church, can I tell you, your faithfulness, it will bear fruit in your life. In, in your community, in your workplace, with, with walking with the Lord, your faithfulness, there will be fruit as you walk with God. And, and, and here's what happened. It freed him from being guilty when people tried to plot against him. They, they said, man, there's nothing that we can charge this guy with unless it has something to do with following his God. Can I tell you, church, your faithfulness will frustrate the false accusations of other people in your life. <laughs> Faithfulness, it, it doesn't mean perfection. None of us are perfect, but it means that, man, I'm striving for integrity in whatever my role is, whatever my job is, whatever my place in my family is. Lord, would you give me a greater integrity? Would you grow me every day? And when I mess up, I'm gonna own it and I'm gonna address it and I'm gonna move forward because I'm gonna walk faithfully with my Lord. Daniel, he was this godly guy living in a very ungodly culture. Watch this, 2 Timothy chapter 3. It actually tells us this. If you're a believer today, you need to be faithful, but it says this. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Some of y'all didn't know that was in the Bible. Here's a second thought for you that as you're faithful, there's going to be some trouble and persecution will happen. It may not be like Daniel. It may not be like the church in China currently, but there will be moments where some trouble comes and someone does something and someone doesn't like the fact that you're standing up for your faith and living for Jesus, persecution happens. But when it does, can I encourage you, don't get discouraged. James says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. What's the source of persecution in Daniel? I think it's interesting, government leaders. In verse six, it says, the administrators and the satraps went as a group to the king and they said, May King Darius live forever. They're trying to butter him up a little bit. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, governors, all of us have agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days except to you shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now your majesty issue the decree, put it in writing so it can't be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. And so he put the decree in writing. And this was a big deal back then. They would not go against their law that was put in writing if it happened, even if they really liked someone in verse seven, when they, when they say this, by the way, I'll mention this. When they say in verse seven, all of us have agreed that's actually a lie. It was a few uh, conspiracy people. You thought conspiracies weren't in the Bible. There you go. And what, this would actually ultimately become their undoing where they would lose their own lives. And if you know the story of Daniel getting thrown in the lion's den, all of this moment most likely uh, happened in one day where they see him praying and then they, they, they go and tell the king all of that. And it was the custom of the Medes and the Persians that when there was 
someone that did something wrong, the execution or the punishment would happen before nightfall. And so this guy, Daniel, he's in the crosshairs of some powerful people. Remember the old quote, power corrupts, but absolute power corrupts absolutely. It's interesting. We, you know, we've heard a lot of people in the last several years and maybe beyond that say what they think the greatest threat to humanity is. And, and, and some people would say, well, the greatest threat to humanity is that politician or the greatest threat to humanity is that sickness or the greatest threat to humanity is racism or, or whatever different things that they would say. I would say to you today, one of the greatest threats to humanity can be the government. You're like, pastor, you can't say that. I would, here's why I say this. In many countries around the world, it's very obvious and it's showing that government cannot fulfill its God-given design according to the book of Romans and according to 1 Peter, what is the God-given design? To restrain evil and to reward good. In Romans chapter 13, verse three, Paul writes, the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, who are doing right but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Do what's right and they'll honor you. The authorities are God's servants sent for your good, but if you're doing wrong, of course you should be afraid. They have the power to punish you. They're God's servants sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do wrong. Remember the guy that wrote those words, Paul. He got thrown in prison for doing what was good, preaching the gospel multiple times, ultimately lost his life. Even back then, government wasn't fulfilling its God-given purpose. It's interesting to think about even just a few years ago that even within our own country today, there's places where the government shut down churches, but they said bars and casinos and strip clubs are essential businesses. That would be a government failure. That would be government rewarding evil instead of standing for what's good and doing what's right. There, there, and, and, and you say, I uh, there's a spiritual reason behind why this is happening. Government is run by people and people are sinners and it's a human system. That, and, and by the way, we need believers that serve in government positions. We need people that would stand up and say, hey, say, hey I'm gonna do what's right. I'm not saying don't get involved. We need to be involved. We need good people. But because it's a human system that's so often made up of evil people with the job to stop evil, it's kind of like, good luck with that. <laughs> Because of what I just said, and, 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 and I would add on top of that, because the enemy that the Bible says he's like the prince of this world for now, keyword for now, but because of those things, even the best governments are bound for failure. So what happens in Daniel 6 is they essentially make this law to say, Daniel, if you pray, you die, bro. I, I, I read this last week, William Pitt, he's a British leader and statesman, I thought it was interesting in one of his things, I was reading the end of his statement, he said, a fearful society will always comply, panicking people will believe anything. I think we've seen that. Here's my encouragement for you today in light of all of that I just said. If you're a believer, don't forget that heaven is ultimately your home and we're temporary citizens of this earth. But don't get so stuck with your head in the clouds that you forget that God has placed you here for such a time as this to make a difference, to live for him and to engage in what's going on and to live righteously and point other people to the Lord your God. I may ultimately be a citizen of heaven, but I'm passing through this world and I got the opportunity, church, and, 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 and I wonder if there's a few people that would stand with me that would say, I am gonna leave a mark. I am gonna leave a better place for the next generation. I am gonna vote my, my biblical values and do what's necessary to say, we wanna create a society that's gonna walk and live for the Lord. So regardless, persecution's gonna happen. There's gonna be trouble. When that happens, I wanna just encourage some people, man, live with boldness, because there's a lot of people in the Bible that lived with boldness, and we see God's blessing because of that. And in verse 10, it said, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. It's a daily habit. And it says, then these men went as a group and they found, excuse me, Daniel praying and asking God for help. 
I wonder if in, in moments, let me just pause for a second. In moments like this, do you truly go to God first and ask him for help when something happens in your life? Remember that, that Daniel at this point, he's older, so he had been doing this his whole life. He was bold as a young man and he was bold now. I wanna encourage some people in the room. I wonder if, there's, if we could raise the next generation that they're bold when they're 15 and they're bold when they're 55, that they're bold when they're five and they're bold when they're 85, that we could create some faithful people that would change a generation. For Daniel, as evil rose around him, it didn't shake his faith. In other words, Daniel wasn't just saying, I'm gonna throw open the windows and stick it to the government today. No, he was going back and saying, I'm just gonna continue to do what I've always done. I'm worshiping the God of heavens and earth that is above any government leader and any person that said, I, I have to pray, I do it every day. I have to seek the Lord. I need his guidance in my life. And so he just went and he did what he had already done every day. He was always faithful and some mandate wasn't gonna change his faithfulness. Daniel probably had in mind at 70, 80 years old, whatever he was, he probably had in mind, man, it's better to die for personal convictions than to live with compromise. He would have known of the stories of other people before him that had been mistreated and, and had been persecuted and, and the other prophets and, and different people. And you know, I, th I think it's interesting that uh, we love to celebrate, and, and it's good. We, we think about the promises of God and the, and the great promises of Jesus in the scripture. And some of y'all have highlighted it seven times with seven different colors, some of his different promises. But there's also some promises that we uh, don't ever underline or highlight. It's like, ooh, that's a little tough. Think about when Jesus in Matthew 10 told his followers, I send you out as sheep among wolves. Not so that you can get eaten, but so that some wolves might get saved. But they are gonna come for you. And he told his followers, you're gonna get arrested. You're gonna get hated. You're gonna, get, you're gonna be disliked. You're, there's gonna be some moments. In fact, Jesus even said, woe to you that, that those of you that everyone speaks well of you. And Jesus also said, I'm gonna use those situations that as you're persecuted and beaten and and people hate you, that you might be able to share your faith from the lowest to the highest in the government and, and all nations of the world. His disciples knew what they were getting into. I think that we need to know that, man, if I am gonna follow Jesus, I'm getting into something that it's not just rainbows and butterflies. Like there is a spiritual battle in our world, but I wouldn't wanna be on the other side of it. Because we know who wins. I've read the last page. Watch what happens to Daniel, verse 13. They said to the king, Daniel, one of your exiles from Judah pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel. He made every effort until sundown, but he knew that he couldn't go against his own law. So the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the den, lion's den. King said to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually rescue you. A stone was placed over the den. The king sealed it with his ring so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. The king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating, without entertainment, and he could not sleep that entire night. I think it's interesting that for Daniel, we don't have a record anywhere that, that he tried to run away. We don't have record that he, he protests, that he says, I, I wanna take it to court. He doesn't argue, we don't have any of that. And he would have known the consequence for praying, but he obviously somehow, even knowing about the lions, had this, this great faith and this great trust in whatever God's will was for his life. Maybe he remembered his three friends that years before that got thrown in a fiery furnace and they made this statement, hey, King Nebuchadnezzar, I almost just said his name totally wrong. Hey, King, we will not serve your gods. We know that our God's gonna, serve us, gonna save us, but even if he doesn't, we will not bow down to you and serve your gods. And God saved them in that moment. Maybe Daniel remembered the deliverance of God. So when it looks like Babylon, when you get thrown to the lions, and it may not be like Daniel, but when there's trouble in your life, are you a person that can say, man, above everything else, I trust the Lord. I trust my God. And, it, and it's easy to say that when things are good. And I'm preaching to myself today. It's easy to say, God, I trust you when, when it's, 
It's a decent time in your life. What about when the worst happens though? Where do you go? What about when, when you lose the job or there's something? Can you still say, God, I trust you above everything else in my life? There's, there's a, another interesting story of a guy that gets sens- sentenced because of his faith to death and his name's Polycarp. He's one of, our, one of the early church fathers of our faith and there's a proconsul that said to him before he died, I'll let you go, just deny Christ. And Polycarp answered him and he said, for 86 years I've been his servant and he's done me no wrong. How can I now now blaspheme my king who saved me? And they poured oil on him and they lit him on fire. What's interesting is that the fire didn't burn him and it was this testimony that God can deliver and he can save. And he didn't actually get martyred or die until they started stabbing him with swords. Here's what I know about our God is that sometimes there's the ultimate deliverance to eternity and he uses that testimony for his purpose in an even greater way. Sometimes he delivers people in the moment like he will Daniel in just a second. Here's the question though that I have for you. When you're in your worst moment, when you are going through whatever it is in your life, what would it take to make you stop following Jesus and trusting the Lord? What would be the straw in your life that breaks the camel's back? Maybe it would be, loss of a family member, sickness, loss of a job, what would it be in your life? Have you considered that, man, when I'm really going through it, I'm still gonna trust God, that he's still faithful and he's still good and he's still just and he's still working things out according to his purpose? Because the enemy would love to make, he would love to use your circumstance and your pain and your family and your situation and the problem that's never been resolved to make you fall into the sin of unbelief that you might not be in eternity with Jesus, but don't go down that road. Remember Job in the Bible? He lost everything. Everything except for his life, his family, his wife, his kids, everything he owned. And in the midst of all of that, he said, though he slay me, I will trust him. Can you trust in the best days and the worst days? Here's a fifth thought for you when it comes to, when it looks like Babylon, is you need to remember that God still delivers. Verse 19, it says, the king got up, first light of dawn. He went to the lion's den, came near the den. He called to Daniel in an anguished voice. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lion's? And Daniel answered. Can you imagine the shock for the king? He's thinking, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just hear like a roar. I'm gonna see some, some gory stuff down, like some, some eaten up guy down in this pit. Instead, Daniel answered, may the king live forever. He's still honoring the king. The guy that threw him in a pit, he's still honoring him. He says, my God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and he gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And at the king's command, the men who created this conspiracy, it says that they had falsely accused Daniel. They were brought in, they were thrown in the den along with their wives and their children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Some of y'all didn't even know that was in the Bible. It's crazy, R-rated. Daniel's delivered and when that happens, man, it's awesome. Anybody thankful that you were delivered from some things in your life? Maybe it wasn't lions, but it was addiction. It was an unhealthy relationship. It was something you thought I'm never gonna be able to move forward from X, Y, and Z. And somehow God pulled you up and brought you out and he saved you. You need to know today that you still serve a God of miracles. And I don't know why sometimes he does what he, I don't understand all of it, but I trust in him that he knows the full picture and sees the bigger plan. And my hope is in heaven. There's stories all through history of God in his sovereignty invading our space and changing or or delivering someone for his glory. Watch the response of the king in verse 25. King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in the entire earth. He had all the scribes stretched out and he said, write this down in every single language because this is going to the world, baby. Watch, Watch what he said, may you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. 
For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and the earth. He's rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Can I tell you that this, I just thought of this. This guy is not even a believer. He is now, but he's preaching better than half of the, the, the believers that I know. And, and he's, he's been like a pagan for all these years. He says, it says, so Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. No, nobody could have foreseen what would happen in this story. I mean, people thought, okay, we can't pray. We can't worship this guy. Daniel's God. It's, it's illegal for 30 days. Yet this is the long-term fruit of faithfulness. Even non-believers are revering God's name. They see the life of the, of the faithful, this guy that's falsely accused and it leaves this huge impression. Here's the, here's the last thought that I have for you this morning. The influence of one, the influence of a few can change generations. We've seen it before. It's in the history books, and I still believe that the influence of a few, that the influence of a few in this room this morning can change generations. Daniel, in his life, he influenced two different empires, two different kingdoms, four different kings, and it went on and on and on. His faith, it led to a response that, man, it spread throughout the, the, the world. If you know the story of Scripture, Daniel's quoted a bunch of times in the New Testament. He's even quoted by Jesus. Daniel would go on to prophesy about Jesus, about this Savior. And there was even a group hundreds of years after Daniel that went on this journey and they traveled to a little town called Bethlehem and they were called Magi. And scholars write about how Daniel was once a leader of this group called the Magi. There's only one way historically that it seems that they, they would be tipped off to go look for this people group that a lot of the world didn't care much about the Jews and go look for this king who would be a savior of the world. Unless it was the influence of Daniel. What I'm trying to say is that Daniel's godly influence lingered for centuries and God can still do that again. That when somebody's faithful, I'm telling you, there's gonna be, when we get on YouTube in heaven someday, some of y'all are gonna be watching the videos of the stories, the, the documentaries, and you're gonna say, her? God did that through her for seven generations? Wow. Faithfulness, boldness, integrity. It doesn't take a ton of people to make a big difference, but when a few people are faithful, and they trust the Lord, man, the results are an influence for the kingdom of God like we've never seen before. So my question is, are you faithful? Are you bold? Do you trust your God? Do you believe in his plans and his purpose? Do you understand that he can use the little influence that you might have in your family or your workplace to change a generation? I'm tell, I'm t I promise you right now, there's people that you would never expect that are in this room that God is saying, I'm gonna, whoo, you don't even know what I'm gonna do through the small acts of every day, just doing the right thing. Of every day, just, just being bold, even when it doesn't make sense, even when it doesn't benefit them. They said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna compromise. Man, there, there, I, I just feel like, man, there is a call to Stop being people of compromise, even on our, in our own culture. I'm not saying we have to riot and blast the government every day, but I am saying, man, when it comes to moments of, okay, here's wrong and here's right, we're towing the line a little bit close sometimes as believers. We need to be able to speak up and say, no, human life does matter in the womb. No, God did create men and he created women and, and this institution of marriage is sacred. It's not just a, marriage wasn't created by America, it was created by God. And so if, we, if we're like, well, I just don't want, I don't want to get involved. No, 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 this is biblical. 
This isn't one of those gray issues. These type of things are stuff that we as the church have to say, man, God has a design and it's not out of hate. It's just out of God has a design and we're gonna live right and we're gonna be faithful and we're gonna live with integrity. And I'm telling you, if you would step into that and out of your life of sin, watch what God can do in your life. And I just felt like I was supposed to tell some people today that man, you've been been confused for a long time. God wants to heal and change you and help you to know who he created you to be from the very beginning, knit you to together in your mother's womb. And I'm telling you, if you would stop searching through relationships, through unhealthy stuff, through stuff that you know is wrong because your great grandma told you out of the Bible, but you've ignored it for so many years, if you would turn your heart toward Jesus, it'll change everything. There's a biblical word, a word, repent. It's not a scary word. It literally means I'm changing my mind, I'm turning around. The church that would say we are going to be a place of repentance, that we might change our minds and turn around and walk with the Lord, whoo, he's gonna do some powerful stuff.